So um, with, this is mainly for me, but uh, but I think for everyone. Um, there's so we've learned over the last ten years that we shouldn't build our own platforms, and we've learned that we can get into already established tools and reach people there. There's a growing conversation in the U.S. about market concentration of the big platforms, and there are some examples now of. Uh, you build something based on a technology underneath, like Facebook or Google, and then the algorithm changes, and then your product is gone. Mm -hmm. um, what do we have any evidence, more than anecdotes, for that? And should civic tech have a monopoly policy position? That's a great question. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Yes, pushing the button is right. It should be. It should be red. It should be red. It should be red. That's it. So, <laughs> I have to hold it down. Okay. That's great. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the tech um, conference, everyone. I, I think that's an awesome question. I think that uh, uh, we've been arguing for a while with little success that if, for example, we want a genuine digital public square, it needs to be built on public servers um, or nonprofit servers, you know, that. that uh, with the exception of Wikipedia, every other commercial website uh, tracks you and monitors you in, in a variety of ways. And there's very little evidence that people know what they're signing up for uh, in the US. So the, 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 that civic health quotient uh, that comes with surveillance and tracking is really worrisome. Um, uh, and the good news is that we've passed the point of peak indifference to the issue. Uh, and now people are paying attention and asking good questions. Um, I would say that in the civic tech success department, there are a number of uh, both for-profit and non-profit uh, uh, projects that serve in a niche. Um, I have a piece coming out uh, in a couple of weeks about Front Porch Forum, for example, which is a neighborhood forum um, that is basically a daily email uh, consisting of, of things that people write just in their uh, close neighborhood. It's, it's primarily, almost entirely in Vermont. Uh, there are several hundred forums by neighborhood or town. The typical one has about a thousand households or residents in it. And the state has, uh, it's about 60% coverage. So 150,000 households in Vermont belong to a front porch forum. And the quality of the dialogue is <coughs> terrific. Um, but they also have paid moderators for every forum. And every post goes through a human moderator before it, it gets cleared for posting. And there's no threading of comments. So even when issues flare up, uh, there's a deliberate slowing down of the speed of information that flows through. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation just did a third party study of front porch forum users, 15,000 of them, uh, and discovered that uh, Usage of the platform makes people feel more neighborly, uh, more inclined to be uh, interested in, in public issues, have better sense of trust of their neighbors. I mean, there's no inherent reason that uh, online platforms have to make people angrier, sadder, uh, more polarized, or more misinformed. But that's because Front Porch Forum isn't solving for massive growth as its number one priority or monetizing its users as much as it can so its founder can get incredibly rich. Um, so, you know, it, it goes to values and choices in the, in the structure of the platform. Um, and we are having a healthy dialogue about it now. I, I do think that our, our civic tech maker community um, is faced with a really hard dilemma uh, because we know that the big platforms have reach and um, if you want to go where people are and you can get more civic information in front of them when they're looking, when they're interested, that you can have positive effects, right? Um, and, and so it's, this is a tension that's not easily resolved. Um, but it's good that we're having the debate now, whereas before it was not even a topic that was discussed. And, and hopefully, look, I, my belief about this is that this is not going to be solved by tech or machine learning or really great data science. It's going to be served by lots more people acting like full citizens, asking questions about things like, how is my data going to be used? Why do I have to sign up here? What if I don't want to opt in? 
Um, and, and that has to become a, a much bigger demand that we can only get from the user side. Uh, uh, and then the, the, I think the market will respond if more people ask for it. Can I just add one more? Yeah, Hi. Um, just to answer your question about whether we have empirical data on how algorithm changes affect that, uh, journalists have been very open with sharing that kind of information. Every time Facebook changes the newsfeed algorithm, they tend to share very specific and large numbers on how that's hurt their traffic. Um, and then on the question of whether we should have standards in civic tech, make a start talking about the tension. I've seen in some of the failed, in some of the graveyard projects, sometimes the problem isn't relying on Facebook. Sometimes it's Trying to, it's like the sin of being too holy of let's use everything possible open source and then those projects get shut down. Um, my colleague at Center for Civic Media at MIT, Charlie Detard, made this amazing uh, group deliberation tool called Intertwinkles, which is from the, the Occupy Intertwinkles. Uh, but it was based on the Mozilla identity standard specifically to avoid Facebook and the Mozilla identity login was shut down so Intertwinkles was <laughs> shut down also. So I do think it's a balance of using what's popular and available and then Ethical. It's definitely. Well, I, just to say one more thing about this, we have to get government involved in insisting on common standards. I mean, there, there's a reason, for example, why we all can share weather data, right? Um, because that's baked into how weather data is collected and and, and made available. Um, so, if it's civic data, why are we relying on on private platforms for things like identity? Right? And it's because 20 years ago, uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans, who all were free market ideologues, decided to privatize the internet. That's really the root cause here. And we, we're now dealing with the, the perverse effects of this. And we're only just at the beginning where there are enough people using the web to suddenly say things like, wait, wait a second. Uh, you know, the post office gives me an address. Why do I have to get a, an email address from a private provider? Right? I mean, we didn't, you know, I, I don't know if Tom Steinberg is in the room. I, the only person I've ever encountered who's, who's like talked about this as a public issue was Tom. Um, and our field is suffering because we've built, you know, we're, we're doing public work on top of private servers. We're really vulnerable because of that. Any other questions? Yep. My question is for Christopher. Um, really interesting research. Um, my first thought when you presented the question of why did the LGP fail in the Nordics, my first instinct to test that, or like you know, to go about my test and try to do the first, what does the LGP do? It makes governments more open, accountable, participatory, and it allows civil society organizations to be a part of the process. Now, if the Nordic government already are ahead of the game in terms of being accountable, transparent, and participatory, and as you said, if civil society feel that they don't need the middlemen to accomplish their goals, isn't that the reason why OGP is failing? Maybe the OGP is, is, is not designed for countries that are doing already so well. And why should we care that the Nordics aren't doing well? Like, you know, well, what what, where does your interest in this come from? And why should we care that the Nordics aren't doing well in the LGP processes? Push the button. <laughs> right, the right one, not the wrong one. Microphone, luxurious. Yeah, so uh, I think that's arguable. Uh, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that the, you know, are we ready to say that high-performing, high-income countries shouldn't commit to doing things as progressively as uh, as uh, less democratically uh, developed uh, in developing countries? Um, I mean, that's an awkward uh, argument to make, but I think it's worth it's worth exploring. On the other hand, there are enough civil society organizations in every one of the Nordic countries who say OGP should be helping us to make all these improvements. Right? And, and if you look at the, uh, the actual arguments about um, what the Nordics are doing well, it's all based on a, a early uh, uh, 20th century model for uh, feeding into the very beginning of policy making processes 
from uh, explicit and short lists of organized groups. So it's, uh, it's about allowing the labor movement to have input into the very beginning of policy processes. And it doesn't allow for anything that, uh, you know, feedback loops or, or monitoring and evaluation or open exchange of information and data. All of these things that are really at the, at the front of our minds when we think about open government. Um, that's not what the uh, Scandinavians are talking about when they say we're already doing it. They just feel as though that the, the established me mechanisms from the beginning of last century are sufficient. And so I think there's lots of room for improvement, and, and, and you could argue that OGP should be a good way to, to pursue that. Very quickly, last question. <laughs> so, so my question is probably between all of you. So it's just thinking about uh, matrix of success in, in, in this space, and you know, how exactly you were it. And so, so I'm thinking about the examples of uh, you know, if you need to report the noise, uh, you know, it might be like you need only one person to put no, 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 it be, like to show that like a thousand people are using it in a, in a community, you know, two people might be enough. And the same thing, you know, in, in other like city tech uh, applications in which, you know, there's like the, you know, you create a deliberative tool, I don't think like 80% like, of the population is going to participate, 80% of the population don't know to put anything about the topic, you know, but it might be that, uh, it's not the 10, 15 like NGOs that you know don't have the uh, and, you know access to the table when the, the deciders are. They can put their input. So, so just thinking about like um, how how people are making decisions about like funding, shutting down, and, and, and opening. How are you thinking about these uh, you know these matrices of uh, of, of, uh, of systems? I, I'm dealing with it in a lot of my own work. When it's you come to you. Know, you, you well, I mean, um, I think there's something that is um, fundamentally wrong in the way we approach civic tech, in the sense that I think you mentioned that 70% of the um, of the startups in Silicon Valley fail, <clears throat> right? Then we are we are saddled with this problem of always having to get grants to build some of these tools, and the the donors don't have the same temperament as Silicon Valley investors. So they, they shut down the project once you can prove impact. But like you said, it might just be a community of um, 500 people that will use that tool to ensure that one piece of, um, one important piece of, one important civic duty is being done for all of us, right? So um, I think the, the problem is the way civic tech is understood and funded. Can I, be, can I just uh, respond quickly to that and maybe also to, to provoke uh, the, the field guide? Uh, Push the uh, button. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, I think it's worth distinguishing between two different kinds of metrics, right? Uh, there's the kind of metrics that we want to justify the work that we do in general to try to show that civic tech or open government makes a difference so that people will keep funding it. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of different ways to do that and it's uh, comparable in some broad sense. And then there's metrics that will influence uh, how we roll out projects. It'll tell us how to design better in very specific niche environments. It will tell us how to adapt what we're doing while we're doing it. And those kinds of things are really hard to generalize. It's really hard to draw conclusions from one context to the other. And it almost always it requires a really significant investment of time and energy and sometimes money. Some of it you can automate when you're using tech, right? You can pull log data and you compare that to external data and you can automate processes. But a lot of it still requires investment and I don't think we'll ever have matrices for that kind of stuff, or nor should we, because it'll make it less useful. So I just make that distinction. We good? Awesome. Thank you so much to all of the speakers. Um,